Gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for all that you are doing in the life of this church. God, I pray for wisdom and discernment as we chart a path forward for this church. But God, we can be confident that you who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion. God, we ask that you, you would do a good work inside of us here this morning. Send your Holy Spirit to give me the words to speak and open up the ears and the hearts of those who need to hear this message today. We pray this in your son's precious and holy name and all God's people said. Amen. So about a decade ago, I had a friend of mine who uh, committed some white collar crime. He was stealing from his employer. Uh, and over the course of some time, he stole to the tune of several hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment. He, he'd uh, take the equipment off the books and then he'd resell it online. Uh, he did that for a period of time until he sensed that they were catching on and he left the job. Well, he wasn't a very good criminal because there were serial numbers on everything that he was stealing. His employer had the record of those serial numbers and he posted the serial numbers on the eBay thing that he, where he was selling them on. It didn't take a genius to figure out who done it. And so eventually he got arrested. Well, from the time he committed the crime to the time he got arrested, he gave his life to Jesus. So when he gets arrested, he gets confronted with his crimes. He cooperated fully. He pled guilty to the charges. He told me, David, I don't know how to represent Jesus and, and pretend like I didn't do this. Well, he got a 21 year sentence, but he turned state's witness and got released after only a year in prison. He helped them find a bunch of other stuff that went missing at the time that he worked there that he didn't do, but he told them who did. Uh, but from the time of his sentence awaiting, um, well, the time of his guilty verdict to the time of waiting his uh, sentence, he was in the Harris County Jail, and I went to go visit him. That was an experience. As his pastor, I got a chance to have some one-on-one -on -one time with him in a room that was reserved for uh, inmates and their lawyers. So it's this small, tiny room. You walk in, they lock you in. There's plexiglass between you and the person you're visiting. And when I walked in, I, I saw my friend, a person who had been racked with anxiety and fear of what was going to happen all throughout the trial, he walked in and he was calm. He was at peace. He had come to terms with his situation and he was resolute. In that period of time, I had sent him a Bible to the jail. And so he was reading scripture and he was using his Bible to talk with the other inmates about Jesus. In fact, they saw him reading his Bible. They would come to him and ask him questions. So this was a very different man than the one who was going through the trial. He had found his peace. Anyway, I was told in this room, we were only going to have 20 minutes. You only have 20 minutes. Okay. So we're sitting there and we're talking, we're visiting. And I see through the window behind him, uh, as, as an alarm goes off, a bunch of guards come running down the hallway behind him. And I'm like, that's not good. And then I hear a door open in the hallway behind me and they come running in the hallway behind me. And I'm like, I'm staying put. I'm very glad that they have locked me in this room because I am safe from whatever chaos is happening outside of this little cell. Well, 90 minutes later, remind you, they said I only had 20 minutes with my friend. 90 minutes later, I look at him and I joked. I said, I think they forgot about us. He's like, yeah, I think so too. Now, the problem was I now had to go to the bathroom. And I was very grateful up to that point for being locked into this room, preventing anything else from coming to get me. But now it's turned into my own little jail cell and nobody realizes we're stuck in here. So I start yelling, help, 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 I'm in here. Please, somebody get me out. My friend, he's having a great time with this. You know, he's just enjoying that he's got his friend with him. Uh, and while I appreciated his friendship, I needed to find the little boy's room really bad. And so eventually flag somebody down to let me out. Now I tell you this, because today we start a four week sermon series on the book of Philippians. Philippians was written by Paul as he was under house arrest in the city of Rome awaiting his trial. And while he is awaiting his trial, 
Paul writes to his friends in the church of Philippi, a church that he had planted 10 years prior. And in writing, Paul has come to terms with his own incarceration. He's, he's at peace with his circumstances, much like my friend had come to peace with his circumstances. Very different circumstances, but kind of that calmness, that resoluteness. And he's writing to the church in Philippi to encourage them to find joy in the Christian experience. In fact, the words joy and rejoice are found 16 times between four short chapters in this book. And so throughout this letter, Paul is encouraging them to find joy, to rejoice, and to grow in their faith. And that's key. To not stay put with where you are with Jesus, but to grow in where you are with Jesus. You know, last spring, you may remember, we did a church-wide survey called the Reveal Survey. And uh, it, it polled the church on a variety of things. But uh, the, the Reveal study, it breaks the church membership down into four categories of their spiritual journey. And what we found, uh, based on those who responded, that many of us... We've, we've, become, we've become stuck in our growth with Jesus. Take a look at these four categories. So the first category is exploring Christ. 8% of those of you who answered that survey said you are just exploring Christ. Uh, 45% of you took that, are in that next step in your walk with Jesus of growing in Christ. 29% of you are in that third step, you're close to Christ and 18% are in that final step of spiritual maturity where you are Christ-centered. And so that means 45% of us are still growing with Christ. And while on the surface that can sound good, what we also discovered was that 46% of you have been in this church for over 10 years. And 24% of you have been here from 6 to 10 years. So when you put those numbers together, what you realize is that a lot of us, in this church, find ourselves stuck in our spiritual walk, and we've been in that same place for quite some time. We're not progressing forward with much momentum in our relationship with Jesus. And so in response to this, this fall, we are, we're rolling out a whole slate of Bible studies and life groups and service opportunities for you all to plug into with the hope that we as a church can move in our faith into that next step, whatever that next step for you is, but to be growing in your walk with Jesus. But that means you have to get involved. You, you, you have to choose to join a life group. You have to choose to sign up for a Bible study or, or start attending a Sunday school class. You have to be intentional to bring your kids. We have a lot of kids here this morning. To bring your kids on a Wednesday night. We've got um, children's choir that's starting back. We've got our, our, our elementary program. We've got our, our mid-high and our senior high. Uh, all that activities on a Wednesday night. We want you to be a part of that. But you have to intentionally choose this. And as you choose it this fall, let's see what God has in store. But in Philippians chapter 1, Paul opens up his letter with an encouragement to his friends. Take a look at this. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul has made his peace with his circumstances and his contentment and his joy, it radiates out and turns into encouragement for other people, for his friends. He says, I thank God for you. Let me ask you this. Whom do you thank God for? 
Do you wake up every day and say thank you for certain people in your life? I hope so. You know, I've done a lot of funerals this summer. And one thing that that has convinced me of is not to take for granted the people that you value in your life. Because they won't always be there. I've buried a lot of fathers. After every one of those services, I have gotten in my truck and I've called my dad and said, I just wanted to hear your voice and tell you that I love you. Thank God for the people in your life who are a blessing to you and don't take them for granted and pray for them. Paul says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Whom do you pray for every day? Every morning I I, I roll over, my alarm clock's going off. I turn that off. I open up my Bible app. I read my Bible and I pray for my wife. I pray for Amy every morning. And when we were teaching the marriage class earlier this year, I told the couples in the class, I encouraged them, pray for your spouse every day. Commit to praying for your spouse. And when days where you and your spouse are really on the same page and everything's going well, thank God that that prayer was answered. And on days when things are not going well between you and your spouse, thank God that that prayer was answered. Because think about how much worse it would have been had you not prayed for them. Those married the longest laughed the loudest on that one. (laughs) Yet Paul is praying with joy for these people. Why? Because he's confident that the God who began this good work in them was going to carry it on to completion. Think of your own spiritual journey. Perhaps you've been through seasons where you are spiritually on fire. You are experiencing God in all new and fresh ways, and it is amazing. That is one of the best feelings in the world, to have that spiritual high. But then think about the seasons of your life where you were really walking through the valley of the shadow. That you were in that tough place, but you still felt the presence of God even in the midst of the toughness. But what about the seasons where you feel nothing? And everybody has spiritual plateaus where it's just nothing's happening. You know, um, a few weeks ago we were in New Bronzeville and we floated the Kamal River. And I heard from many of you, you're like, I don't recall the Kamal being that, that hard on you. Oh, okay, this is my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, but, you know, there was points on it where the water was running fast and it was dynamic and it was fun. And then there was points where the water wasn't moving at hardly at all. And it was just, it was so close to being stagnant. You know, it was in those points you decide either you go with the slow flow or you start paddling. And I chose to paddle. I, I didn't want to just sit there barely moving. I grabbed the families all attached to my, my tube and I was moving us along. Paul is confident that God, who started this spiritual journey in them, would bring it to completion. You, my friends, you are a work in progress and God is the one doing the work. But in the slow times, are you content to be spiritually stunted or are you going to get out and help paddle? You know, we call this sanctification. In Methodist world, we call this sanctification. That by God's grace in our lives, we are moving on to Christian perfection. That is the trajectory that each one of us is on after we profess faith in Jesus. We are moving on to Christian perfection until the day we meet Jesus. Whether we get to perfection in this life or not, that's not the point. That's the direction we're headed on. But it's only by God's grace at work in you that that can even happen. But you have to have some skin in the game. You have to be a willing participant. You have to have some sweat equity in your own spiritual development. So will you participate in the good thing that God is doing and has been doing in your life? Or do you just take this more laissez-faire approach and just let what happens happen? But Paul, he doesn't stop with just being confident that God is going to do this good work. He spells out what that good work looks like. Flip over to uh, verse 9. 
And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I need you to get this. This is like my main point for today. The continued good work that God is doing in your life is tied to your capacity to love other people. I'm gonna say that one more time so it really sinks in. The continued good work in, that God is doing in your, in your life is tied to your capacity to love other people. So that's why Paul is praying that love, their love may abound more and more and more. Meaning the bigger the heart you have for others, the quicker the pace of your spiritual journey. Now, I know it's not Christmas time yet, despite the fact that I've got multiple staff playing Christmas music in their office. I was going to make a bigger joke about that until Ava yesterday. She was a little bored in the evening. Amy and I were laying down watching our uh, shows and Ava she tells Alexa, Alexa, play Christmas music and cranks it in the house. And it's like drawing Christmas uh, scenes and hanging them all around the living room. She's ready. She was begging Amy last night. Can we start tomorrow? Can we hang the Christmas deck? No, we haven't even hit Halloween yet. <laughs> but do you remember how the Grinch stole Christmas? Like the original animated one. You remember that one? Remember at the end of the movie, the Grinch's heart grows three sizes right? He was, he was so grumpy because it was a capacity issue. He didn't have the capacity to love other people, to love the who's and who will, right? It wasn't until his heart grew that his life changed. Here's the thing. Those who love little will experience God very little. Those who love lots We'll experience God a whole lot more. Friends, to get out of those spiritual plateaus you find yourself in, you got to open your heart to those around you. Now, we're going to offer some great studies this fall. We'll unveil all of that list this week. But I need you to understand that this, your spiritual journey is not just about head knowledge. It, it, it is in part... But it's not just about head knowledge, knowing more about Jesus. It's about growing in your capacity to love others the way Jesus loves you. Now, I need to say that with a warning. The larger your capacity to love, the more vulnerable you become. You know, the more you love like God loves, the more you're going to hurt like God hurts. You can't have the love without the possibility of rejection. Now, we often think of God as being very stoic, not showing a lot of emotion. We see in Scripture that, yeah, God loves, God gets angry, but we limit in our minds the range of emotion God deals with. But what about hurt? What about pain? What, what about rejection? We know that Jesus is the full incarnation of God. And what do we see in Jesus? We see vulnerability. Jesus suffered. When Jesus was going to the cross, he looks out at the city of Jerusalem and scripture says he weeps because of their rejection of him and what that's going to entail for them. So to love like Jesus means you're going to hurt like him too. And that's part of the spiritual journey that most of us don't hear or talk about, but it's something that can't be avoided. Yet as your love grows, you naturally will become more pure and blameless, preparing you to meet with Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to look as much like Jesus as possible when I meet with Jesus. I want to be transformed a lot in this life before I meet with him. But only love and grace can forge your heart to look more and more like Christ. Yet there is some intentionality to this. Choices have to be made. Habits have to be broke or formed. 
You have to be willing to let God do the work. So later in chapter 1, and I encourage you to follow along with us and start reading Philippians um, with us throughout these four weeks. But he opens up about his incarceration, and he reveals to the, the church in Philippi his own internal debate. The debate is, do I allow myself, is it better for me to go to the executioner and to go and be with Jesus or to stay alive and to be an encouragement to you? And that's the tug of war that he feels. But at the end of chapter one, he says this, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Friends, let me ask a very pointed question. Do you conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? Well, what is the gospel? The gospel is that we are loved and saved by God's great grace, and that grace is extended to everyone. So does the way you act reflect that? In your treatment of others, is love and grace extended in the treatment of yourself is love and grace extended do others see jesus in you when you look in the mirror do you see jesus in you if you grow in your capacity to love you will Increase your heart size and you will automatically begin conducting yourself more in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, if you find yourself struggling in this process of like how to go about doing this, there's this great song by a Christian artist. His name's Brandon Heath. And I, I, I invite you to allow these lyrics to be the anthem that you say in your life over and over and over again. They go like this. Give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see everything that I keep missing. Give your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the brokenhearted, the ones that are far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the ones forgotten. Give me your eyes so that I can see. Friends, let that be your prayer so that the God who began a good work inside of you can bring it on to completion. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person who has gathered here today. God, we thank you that you have begun this new work inside of us. God, give our, help us give ourselves fully over to this process. And when we find ourselves not feeling anything, to really step forward and take initiative to meet you in the process understanding that you're never far from us. Help us grow in our capacity to love others. And from that love, let our spiritual life take off again. God, we thank you for these things as we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.